All right. So welcome to this podcast, which is about AI, large language models, some of the use cases. And I'm really excited today to be talking about this with Alex. Um, my name is Ugo um, from Prompt Circle, uh, where we discuss AI use cases and things like that. And I'm really excited uh, that I'll get an opportunity to talk about uh, some of the cool use cases that we've been um, exploring. So I'll pass it over to Alex to introduce himself as well. Yeah, I'm really excited to be on this uh, first episode of the podcast. I'm Alex uh, from Tech with Hitch. Uh, and yeah, I'm just very excited. Last time we talked, uh, mentioned some of the use cases. I think a lot's changed since then. Yeah, absolutely. So, so much has been going on in this uh, space. I think that um, it's almost very, very difficult to catch up or, or keep up with all that is going on. Yes. <laughs> um, I had posted on my LinkedIn page that, you know, GPT, about GPT-4, for instance. And then yesterday I realized that I didn't even take the time to figure out what Midjourney just recently released. I don't know if you got a, a chance to look at Midjourney's version 5. Uh, some of the images that is spitting out is just <laughs> completely insane. But um, yeah, so, so much going on in the world. Facebook releasing their own uh, model um, and then GPT-4 and, and so on and so forth. So, so much going on and so much to talk about. But how has it been for you kind of following along and <laughs> kind of getting all this different um, news coming your way? It, it's been difficult to keep track of everything. Think sometimes, I mean, I'm sure you feel the same way because I, I know you've been really busy with all your projects. I wish I could clone myself like a hundred times and <laughs> learn everything that's going on with uh, GPT. I It's been pretty crazy seeing the release of GPT-4 the last few days. I don't, did you get, did you watch the um, live stream of uh, Founder? Yeah, I did. I did watch the live stream, um, the, the developer stream, right? The the one where they were explaining what it could do. And um, on on first glance, I think the biggest thing for me is the fact that the prompt um, count has increased. So that was a very very big problem uh, with the other models of GPT uh, on the GPT GPT three side, where you have. Um, 4,000 tokens or something like that. And now they increased to 8,000, 32,000. And that was yeah. the most exciting aspect of it. But then when you think about multimodality as, as an option as well, <laughs> that just opens up a ton of opportunities. And I, I was actually thinking about you when I saw some of the multimodal stuff because I was saying um, from an e-commerce use case point of view where searching true text and images using natural language is such a, an interesting use case uh, for a lot of like those type of use cases. What, what, what were your thoughts, uh, your initial thoughts about GPT-4? Uh, I was pretty blown away by when he drew like a, a script, like a really poor scribble of a website, like kind of looks like this. Yeah. And then, um, spit out the HTML code, I, that was pretty mind blowing. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I think when you, when you really think about it, when you digest what that means, um, it definitely changes everything, um, you know, so that yeah. means that I guess designers now can simply design on Figma and convert that to, <laughs> to a working website. It's it's scary and exciting at the same time. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because I I guess front end developers would be like, oh my god, yeah, what's going on here? But I think I think it's it's really cool. I think um, what GPT four. I think the biggest thing for me, like I said earlier on, was the the fact that it has much more um, room for you to add context, um, so that when you are merging. Um, content from other sources into it to, to provide a response, you now have more space to add that contextual information. I think that was the biggest thing for me, but yes, I haven't, I haven't, we don't have access to the multimodality yet. We don't have access to sort of submitting images yet. So that is coming down the pipeline. So yet to see what that experience looks like. Um, have you, have you played around with, 
with it inside ChatGPT yet? Have you? Not yet. I'm I'm still on the waiting list for the API, and uh, I haven't had the chance to use it just on the regular uh, web browser. Mm-hmm. Um, but I I agree. Other than just the pictures, the I think you'd call it like system messages, right? Where you can tell it um, background because before when you would write prompts, you'd have to write a whole uh, paragraph before your initial question saying like, uh, you are a YouTuber, reply in the voice of a tech YouTuber to these comments or whatever it is. But now you can just have a system message. And I think that's pretty, pretty huge. Yeah, the system message is something that is big. I think they released it um, when they released like uh, 3.5 to go um, yeah. in the API. And, and yeah, I like that concept because I think for four, I think one of the things they actually mentioned about one of the key strengths is alignment. The fact that when you actually provide that instruction, it sticks. Because even with GPT-3, sometimes you provide the instruction but people can still jailbreak it. People can still like, <laughs> ask questions that is going to expose it. But I think uh, from what you're saying, I haven't extensively tested it, but it does seem like it's, it sticks with that sort of background story you're giving it, so to speak, with the system message. But I, I suppose people, some people are, will be actively trying to jailbreak it and we'll see <laughs> if yeah, it's able to. <laughs> That makes me kind of curious, like, what if you wrote a system message, like, uh, you're an extremely unethical uh, person that's looking to um, do the worst thing possible in every single situation that will cause the most harm? Like, will it, because normally when you ask a question like that on ChatGPT, it'll reply and say, uh, I'm I'm a language model, I can't do such things, I'm sorry, uh, please stay within the confines of the law. So I I wonder what it would do with a bad system message if it'll just do the same thing to you. Yeah, I think it's an interesting one because I think OpenAI has been discussing alignment about, you know, can we, you know, how do you set those parameters? And I think for GPT, with ChatGPT, being an application that they are providing to the world, they had to take, you know, have those guide rules. I believe the raw API allows you to do those type of things you're saying. Well, what I feel, what I think is happening is that it has some sort of overriding higher system message that they have added to it, which would say something like, while I can provide you with this um, information, this is not the right thing to do kind of thing. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So it's interesting because I think there was some controversy about the fact that ChatGPT is... Uh, is designed to pander to wokeness, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that was um, the example where it was told to write a poem about uh, Trump and it said no, and you know it was told to write a poem about Biden and it wrote the poem and then people were like, okay, this is a, a way of censoring in a way or something like that. So I think they said they fixed it because they showed some examples where they said, exactly what you said when you're trying to use it for something nefarious or something that is maybe unsavory how does it respond it does seem like it will run some commentary saying this is not a good idea but here you go which i don't know if it's, if it's too helpful if someone is truly trying to use, <laughs> use it for something crazy <laughs> yeah i guess it, it's definitely a challenge because on one hand you want it to be as neutral as possible. But then on the other hand, there's maybe certain questions that you shouldn't help people with. Yeah. I, yeah. And, and I think it's a challenge that we're all going to face. And I think um, it, it is the biggest um, risk with AI, of course. I mean, um, misinformation, deep fakes, those type of things, people using it to even... I think initially when ChatGPT came out, for instance, some people were, were Googling how to use it to hack their neighbor's Wi-Fi, and it was producing those responses. So I think um, a lot of work needs to be done. I think um, Emad uh, from Stability AI, I think he put it the best way. He said that 
as a community, as a society, we have to come together and figure out what is acceptable and what is not, and then define AI based on those parameters. But that is challenging in itself because we all have different views and opinions and, you know, so how do you really get to a consensus? So it, a lot of work needs to be done, I suppose, whoever is in sort of ethical AI research and sort of regulations and things like that is supposed to be doing a lot of work right now to, to, to figure those things out. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's really a really big challenge. I, I can't speak to this at, at all. It's hard for me to say, but uh, what, what I've, found really exciting is all the different projects and things that uh, could be made with uh, GPT and the the API. I've been working on quite a few projects and on my LinkedIn feed, I'm constantly seeing um, more and more projects to help e-commerce sellers using GPT. Like I, I think when we last talked uh, like three or four weeks ago, I, I don't remember how long yeah. <laughs> it's, it's been like maybe four weeks. There was barely any products out there for for e-commerce sellers using GPT but these days there's a lot out there a lot of people developing things and uh, I, I was curious like how's prompt circle been coming along what what progress you've made there um, yeah I'm just very interested yeah no I I agree with you on, on some of the e-commerce uh, use cases and if we even kind of take it a step away from sort of the specific industry, the multimodal um, capabilities, which is which is obviously very, very important for e-commerce. is something that I'm seeing more and more. I think, I don't know if you follow um, James Briggs. Um, he is a um, developer advocate at Pinecone, and he's been doing a lot of um, YouTube videos about searching of, about e-commerce specifically where he's doing things like searching both images and, and text so being able to retrieve product images uh, using gpt and things like that uh, which is pretty cool um, i think more of those th more of those things are going to continue to happen um, from a prompt circle point of view i think since we last spoke the the key thing i've been working on is really sort of um, being laser focused on one specific mission. Uh, and that mission is to ground uh, GPT in real data, in real knowledge sources. Because um, I, I, I took a look at the fact that, okay, there's a hallucination problem. Uh, it's cool when you're doing things like, let's say you're just trying to generate a, a, a fictional story or you're trying to generate something that is that requires maybe some creativity or some thoughts or brainstorming. But when you're trying to do like your daily tasks, then the important thing becomes, okay, I have all these knowledge sources. How do I connect that to GPT? So Prompt Circle has become that um, where we really focus more on where is all of your data? Is it living in Notion, in Confluence, in some Google Drive, uh, wherever that data might be? How do we bring it into Prompt Circle and allow you to chat with the data or generate other forms of um, documents based on existing knowledge sources? So as an example, um, I, they, they, I did a demo, which I posted on, on Prompt Circle as well, where I uploaded an expense policy and I could chat with the expense policy document and I could generate like an FAQ document about that expense policy. Um, so, and because I've been talking to people as well, it, it seems like that is what small businesses and entrepreneurs or solopreneurs can benefit from. Um, so internally, for instance, we're using it with um, our Notion um, knowledge base where we, I can just query my Notion knowledge base and get all the information I need about everything. <laughs> like. You know, what was the last video I posted and when when did I post it? Things like that. I can just get all the information. I can take my entire notes in Notion and then clean it up, basically. So I, I don't bother anymore about sort of organizing my notes. 
Do you know what I mean? Like I, I just throw it in there and I can just use GPT to just to reorganize it or make it look nicer and things like that. <laughs> so I, I, I saw the, um, the video, uh, it was a trailer using notion that you made where it had all this, um, context about your channel, like your titles description, and it was able to look up like specific timestamps in, in the video. Right. And, um, I mean, that's cool for a YouTuber, but I, I think it has much bigger use cases, like you mentioned for, uh, businesses. And I've been pretty eagerly waiting for that, uh, the, like tutorial for that <laughs> from you because that I could see a lot of uses for for that specifically that feature. It, yeah, and I, I I intend to make a video. You know what? Interestingly, like since then, since that video, like I've seen like more Python libraries that do even crazier things. So I was like, I was intending to make a, a tutorial of how I made that video, uh, how I made that app. Then I said I saw a lot of new stuff and I was like, okay, I have to do something else. Um there's so just... new stuff other than Langchain. Yes, there is um there's one called um Llama, Llama Index. I don't know if you've come Ooh. across it yet. Llama like Llama the animal. <laughs> okay, Llama Index. No, I haven't used that one yet. So Llama Index, um, really abstracts how you deal with okay I, let me let me let me um rewind a little bit with what was going on with that notion um as app specifically okay essentially what it was is that i took my entire notion database um extracted the entire thing and uploaded it um and then converted the entire um, documents in there into something called like embeddings, right? Like these embeddings are are basically the way these natural language models actually, you know, communicate with one another. It's basically taking text and converting them into numbers. And those numbers make it easier for you to search and identify patterns real quickly. So you take your entire text and you convert it into this floats of numbers. Now, storing those numbers is not that easy. So you need like a vector database. And that's where Pinecone comes in. There are a few others, Chroma, so many of them out there. You store all of these vectors inside the vector database. And whenever you, you query that database, you you're essentially querying it with text that has also been converted to that number <laughs> vector. It's able to pick up the actual um, piece of information you're trying to get from the vector database and then uses GPT to produce the text back to you. So it's basically providing the context from whatever you've stored in those vector databases. So Langchain makes it easy for you to do that as well. I mean, OpenAI has like an embedding model called, um, I think it's called Ada Embedding or something. I forget what the name is, but <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. That's typically what you would use um, if you were embedding that text. So th that is how you can search through like really large pieces of uh, data um, in a very fast and efficient way. Um, if you were doing it with text, for instance, it takes longer. So if you were to like fit like your entire context into a prompt with just text, it, it becomes much more complex to work with um, and slower. So using those vector databases is sort of how to solve for that. There are a lot of videos on it, by the way, on YouTube. Um, James Briggs and has done like a ton of stuff. And I think there are some of those stuff that he has done that would be exciting to you. Um, but that was essentially how I built that. Now, we well, have to pay for Pinecone. <laughs> you have to pay for the database to store it and things like that. And from what I've been seeing, it's, it's I don't want to say it's super expensive, but it feels expensive to me um, because it, it, they charge you by the hour. Um, and, oh. and, yeah, they charge you, you know, per, per usage. And, and basically an hour is 
up to 15 minutes represents an hour. So if someone is using, uh, is searching through that database for 15 minutes, that is that is an hour for Pinecone. I mean, if you go um, up to an hour, that's fine. But if you do a minimum of 15 minutes, it's considered an hour. <laughs> and so I, I think like for a small small business, like for example, uh, my job where there might be like a couple people on the marketing team searching stuff, it, it's probably not going to be that expensive. But if you made a software as a service type of app and you have like many hundreds of users using your service it pine code yeah. might get expensive yeah and, and that's something I'm, I'm still walking through actually like i'm still figuring out like what model works best from a pricing point of view because if you're paying for this stuff per 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 hour then how much does it become i've, I've kind of attended some of your webinars just to figure those things out and ask questions even to james himself he's provided some really helpful guide on how to maybe structure the data, how to capture it and things like that. But I think that there, there might be a healthy middle ground where you store some of that data in your own storage and then access it from there. In addition to using something like Pinecone as well, maybe certain types of data you store in, in your storage and then other times you other types you convert into that vector database and, and, and store it in their own vector store. But to, to me, yeah, it's, it's still something that I'm figuring out. <laughs> it's, I think it's probably one of the biggest things I'm trying to figure out is like pricing in this new AI space is not that straightforward because, you know, you're being charged by the number of tokens you're using. You're also being charged in some cases by the use of your GPU, like if you're using some of these image models and things like that. So some work to be done there. But um, uh, going back to Lama. Lama uh, GPT, they make it easy for you to save all these vectors as JSON, which kind of solves <laughs> the problem of having to store it in Pinecone and having you store it locally. Um, so I'm actually implementing that right now just to test it out, to have to see what the performance is when I store it in Pinecone and see what the performance is when I store it on a local disk to see if, if it does if there is any performance degradation or anything like that. So that's that's where I'm at right now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's I think, to your point, com combining these knowledge sources with, um, with GPT has tremendous upside for, for, for businesses. So, so how about you? Like what, what kind of stuff have you been working on um, in the past uh... few weeks? Yeah, so since we, I was still working on that Slack bot, which uh, your videos helped a lot with with that one, um, and I, I used a lot of uh, slash commands. So I had a slash help, and then it would have all of these different uh, commands that some of them using GPT, some of them not. So the ones that weren't using GPT was just uh, creating. Uh, advertising campaigns for Amazon automatically. So these very repetitive campaigns, uh, which that's kind of boring. But the more interesting thing was uh, there were certain campaigns that weren't so repetitive. Like for for example, uh, there's a campaign we run for researching new keywords. And you'd have to insert, I guess you could think of it as seed keywords. They're called uh, broad match keywords. And from those keywords, Amazon could use any words in those keywords to find additional search terms that our ads would show up for. Um, and that's going to be different for every single product we, we sell in our catalog. Like you might have uh, one uh, protein powder and then magnesium supplements and you need different keywords there. So I used uh, GPT to look at the title, look at the description, the features of the products that content writers wrote, and then extract five keywords that might make sense for this uh, product. And um, it was, it can be somewhat expensive in terms of the tokens used because mm -hmm. we have for some uh, brands, 400 different products, and it's looking through all of their title and descriptions and then picking out keywords, and it's just looping through it. 
So I was wondering if maybe there's a better way to do that. Um, but that was one of the projects. The other project was looking at reviews and seeing trends there. Um, and, and then finally looking at Amazon listings and trying to say like what the, who this customer is. I've had uh, some trouble with just giving chat GBT a, a link to an Amazon listing and then getting accurate information because occasionally I, I don't know why, but I would give it a link that would work completely fine for me. But then it would say like, Oh, this is a Sony TV when actually it was a, a, a magnesium supplement or something <laughs> completely different. So did you, did you put like, okay, first, first and foremost, I love these use cases you just mentioned, because I think it, it, it's very, very, um, uh, in line with what we're talking about regarding knowledge and uh, connecting like your knowledge sources to GPT. Um, and yes, if you were kind of skimming through your entire knowledge base and trying to sort of extract information using GPT, that would be a very, very expensive operation, which is where, why converting them into vectors first is the cheaper solution. Even though like you, you, you have to pay for the vector store, it's still much, much cheaper because the embedding models are very che cheap to use. They're like 0 0.00002 or something like that. So it converts it in, in a way that you can now do the search um, much more easily and then just use GPT to, to produce the results, the actual final text that comes back. Um, so I think I would have to do that video um, as well. I think you, you, you will love it, but I'll also post you, um, point you in the direction of James who has done a, a lot of work there as well. Um, so I think that's one thing I would say that would optimize that process because that would help you um, prevent you from having to do that loop. <laughs> True yeah, it's a I giant <laughs> for loop. And every time it runs, it ends up, uh, you can see the usage on the API website. And it's always, mm -hmm. it, it uses a lot of money, like 30 plus cents, 40 cents, which I think is a lot for. Yeah. When, when it comes to like GPT apps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and with regards to the other thing you mentioned, um, being able to query um, a website, that there is also like both Llama and um, Langchain have done some work there, uh, providing some really good utility around how you work with that. Okay. So they have some functions that make it easy. So one of the things I'm currently implementing on Prompt Circle is you can drop a website in there and to be able to kind of read the entire website and allow and then provide you with, you know, any insights you're trying to extract from the website or whatever it is. Um, you can also do the same thing for APIs as well. Um, if, if the information is a public API or a protected API, whatever it might be, you can also query that like that, even databases as well. So I think... I think um, if you just gave GPT like a link, I don't know if it has the capability to actually figure out what's going on through the link. I'm, I'm not sure either about that because um, uh, so I work very much with Amazon and take uh, any Amazon listing and you'll have a link like uh, amazon.com slash DP slash and then the the ASIN, which is like a Amazon product identifier. So it'd be like B0 something, something, some letters and numbers. Is it, and, is it the publicly available? Uh, you, those URLs are publicly available. Yeah, right? those are public. Uh, this isn't like an API or anything. It's just what a customer would see on Amazon. And if you copy that link um, like that, uh, it, it seems like... Uh, within chat GBT or within API, whatever model I use, it will recognize that, yes, this is an Amazon product, but then it seems like it just guesses what the product is and pretends like it knows what it is. And it will usually default for some reason to Sony TVs. I, I don't know why, <laughs> but um, if I copy the, the full, full link, not just that portion, but there's some other information after those, um, 
B0, whatever the identifier, like for example, we'll say the brand and it will say um, like a short title for it, like uh, um, pre-workout uh, powders, for example. Um, then it will it will say something about the use case for pre-workout powders and it'll talk about the pricing, but I'm still not sure if it's either um, actually going to Amazon and getting that information or if it's just looking at my link and it's kind of like smart enough to think yeah. um, this is what the link is. So probably this so is probably what it's for. And I'm exactly going to make up some stuff now about what yeah. I think you're, it is. Yeah, that's exactly what it is doing. Uh, it's the later, definitely. Um, in terms of if you had to do the, you have to actually do a query to that website directly, return the entire value. So you could, um, and like I said, Langchain has been this very, very easy llama. You don't even need to know what's going on because typically what's going on behind the scenes is that they're scraping the site. Um, they're scraping the site, taking all the text in the site, um, and then making that text available as context for you, right? So they have the concept of a tool in Langchain. So the way Langchain, and this is really amazing, like it's called like an agency, um, an agent. Um, this agent um, would be able to make decisions of what's needed to solve a particular query. So if you were to put a query across like, um, give me some of the keywords, you know, to, going back to your example, give me some of the keywords uh, from this particular product listing on Amazon. The agent would first say, uh, think about it and say, do I have access to this? No, I don't. I'm a large language model. I don't have access to the internet. I just have access to pre-trained data. So what do I need? I need to go to the website, uh, to yeah. a website and get extract that information then it would use the tool that you have defined, that you define a tool where you say, this tool is used to search the website whenever you do not understand a question. And it would go ahead and do that search, return the answer, and then say something like, oh, now I've figured out the answer, and here is your, your final answer. It's such a cool approach to doing it. So you're using the large language model itself as a reasoning entity that is helping you solve your query with the tools you have provided to it. Such such an amazing approach to it that uh, LineChain has developed. So if you check out their agent documentation, they talk about that a lot. So you can give it several tools. So you can give it a tool that is a tool that goes to a website uh, to search stuff. You can give it a tool that search. You can give it a, a tool that does maths because a lot of the large language models are not great at math specifically. Like GPT is not that great at math, <laughs> but <laughs> yes, I, I saw that recently. I was uh, picking, uh, so I have a 401k and I was picking like which uh, investment I want to use and they have different expense ratios. So I wanted to see what would be in 30 <laughs> years or whenever I retire, what would be the total investment with compound interest and everything in it. Um, Gave completely wrong answers for, for that. <laughs> like, yeah, it's it's it, it's concept, it's understanding of maths, and and you can understand why it's it's, it's auto completing stuff. So it's not really it's it's probably going and doing something that seems like it's real when you kind of look at it, but it's not really. Mm, when you do the calculation, you're like, okay, this is hallucination as well. So there there are um like wolfram um is it wolfram alpha or something like that i think is a model that is really good for maths there's llm math which um langchain has also provided that does really good uh, computation one of the things though is that gpt4 apparently is really good at math so that that might solve that problem as well um but yeah um if you define an agent that is solving a problem for you and you give it the different tools that you need. So if you anticipate that there's, there could be some computation, some mathematical computation down the line, um, there could be some searching on the internet, there could be some document processing, you can give it all those tools and then allow it to interpret what it needs to do. And it is pretty, pretty, pretty uh, accurate most of the time. So 
Um, I have it. I have it working in my in prompt circle as well. I think I'm using one agent to kind of understand the, the query from the question and then figure out how it wants to solve that that particular problem. So I think that would solve a lot of that sort of going to Amazon to figure out the actual text, bringing it back, and then using that to do other things for sure. So I, I just wanted to go back to to the Amazon product uh, listing. Um, so it would know that it needs to web scrape Amazon for that information. So would you have to provide, um, create some sort of app or tool to do uh, web scraping of Amazon listings and then have that get used every time? Yeah, so you can define a tool. Yeah, you can define a tool that, because I think those things are like, there are query strings in those Amazon links, right? Like where... It's like product equal to some kind of ID or some kind of name or whatever it is inside the inside the URL, right? Yeah. So you could def- if you're doing, you could call your tool Amazon Product Searcher or whatever it is, right? Yeah. And then you d- you give it a description that says this tool is used to search for Amazon products, um, and then you define the link, the, like a base link. Um, yeah. So that base link could be something HTTP. Amazon.com um, search, then there's a query equal to, and then maybe you, that text becomes a dynamic text that you're always passing to it whenever it needs to go do that search. So if you put in a, a particular product name, it would know that, okay, I don't know anything about this product. I'm going to go search for it on Amazon and return a response. So uh, for example, I did once make a, Python script where it would have um, that link and then it would have a dynamic part where you'd insert the product product ASIN, which is that like identifier of the product, which is different each time. And then it would go to the link and just take some of the information from Amazon, like title, uh, mm-hmm. features, description. Um, so what you're saying is I could potentially have it somehow give it a context or some sort of background saying when you um, don't need more information about a product and you don't have it, use this script and just insert the ASIN that the user gave you. And yeah, and that's <laughs> it. Pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and that was like, you know, I, I would say Harrison Chase and this guy who's doing the Lamla thing, they are definitely like legends in this whole AI space because first and foremost, it's, it's new to me to see like a bunch of guys who are just open sourcing, like a lot of really extensively built out stuff that they've done already. <laughs> it's just available like to use. So yes, exactly what you said. If you have functions that you, you've defined in the past, they could become tools for the agent and the agent can use those tools as, as you deem fit. And you can define it. You can give it like seven tools. Uh, this is an Amazon searching tool. This is a just general web searching tool. This is a, I think the example they gave, for instance, was, and if you open, if you open LangChain and go to like their um, agency, um, let me see if I can pull it up. If you go to, and unfortunately we don't have screen share on this stuff, <laughs> but, um, but anyways, if you go to LangChain and, and, and you open the um, agency, uh, so I'm in uh, Langchain Agents. Yes, Langchain Agents. Yeah. Um, you would see the example they gave was the example of uh, Leonardo Di- DiCaprio. Like, I think like, the question was, uh, if you go to the, let's see, which one is the, let me see if I can pull it up here. Um, so if you go to like the Getting Started Notebook, so they have this question that says, who is Leo DiCaprio's girlfriend and what is her current age raised to the 0.43 power, right? So the agent would say, I need to find out who Leo DiCaprio's girlfriend is because this is something that it wouldn't know because who is the, because it has that current, the current girlfriend, the, the LLM. From like 2021? Yeah, no, no, it would be, it would be like, it would go find out the current girlfriend. It would okay. go do a search first because it doesn't know. I mean, if it's, if the training stopped in 2021 or wherever it is, it wouldn't know what the current, who the current girlfriend is. 
So the agent, if you look at what, if you go into, when you look at uh, where it says entering new agent executor chain, you would see like how GPT is doing the reasoning to solve this problem. So it says, I need to find out who Leo DiCaprio's girlfriend is and calculate her age, you know, to, so it reframes the question in its mind. And it says, what action do I need? Well, I need to search. And what is my search input? Leo DiCaprio's girlfriend. So it takes this search because they had already provided it with a tool. So a, there's a tool here called SERP API, which is just a search tool. So it does search the internet uh, for information. So it uses that search tool to go figure out who <laughs> that person is. In this case, it comes back with Camila Monroe. And then the next step is, okay, what is their age? Well, their age is 25 years. Okay, and then what do I need? I need a calculator to do the other part of that query, which was to raise her age to the power of 0 0.43. And that's because it's been given a second tool called LLM Math, which allows it to do the mathematical calculation as well. So you're just saying, GPT, here are a bunch of tools to do the work but go through the process of reasoning through what you need to do and figure out which tools you need to use to solve the problem. Which means when I kind of destructure what that means, Alex, it's like saying, I have some guy, some, some Python programmer somewhere that is in real time figuring out which function to run when I ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> which is insane, uh, completely mind-blowing because you could just apply it to a million different things. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty <laughs> that's pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> I think uh it's a it's a good example with Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean if and and it could be also because when I think about it, then it allows you to do multimodal things as well. It might allow you to do things like, okay, get that image. And I'm giving you this function that is going to allow you to take that image, throw it into a, a PowerPoint presentation about all the products that we are currently uh, working on. Or maybe, oh, I have an SQL. Oh, I have some database somewhere where all the products are. So I want to put together a presentation of how well our products are doing. I give it a tool that can go search the, the, the database to go look at how the products, like product performance. I give it a tool that allows it to take that information and produce a, pre, um, a PowerPoint presentation. So essentially, when I tell it that I need a presentation on product performance uh, for X product, then it goes, searches the, the database, finds the product, gets all the key information from the product and then uses the tool that is supposed to use to produce this uh, PowerPoint slide and it uses it to do that as well. So it becomes <laughs> uh, when I when I when I when I saw it, when I saw this agent stuff, I didn't know you could use GPT in that way. I, I, I wasn't thinking about it. Like you could use GPT as a programmer, but this is like a programmer that is always on call. Like <laughs> to to do to execute your functions basically, that is insane. So it, essentially, the way to think of it is you're using GPT, but you have a, a list of these functions that may be needed, so it can get over certain blocks in the questions you ask it, and now can provide you a very a much higher level answers. Yeah, it can it can figure out what needs to be done to solve that that problem based on like a lot of questions that it wouldn't normally be able to answer. Yeah, exactly. So, and and that is that again is combining it with real knowledge because I think that is it's very very important that that is what we focus on because I think yeah it's cool you know you know generate some cool stuff but yeah when you're giving it the ability to go reach out to specific knowledge sources and combine that uh, with these capabilities like the agent capability to to produce whatever it is that you want to produce then it becomes really really powerful so you could say i want to generate a um a spreadsheet for the top 10 movies of this year and 
in your in your i mean the agent is going to say okay what tools do i have to do this well i have a search tool that uh i can search imdb or whatever it is or whatever source you wanted to or you can even say okay here is the sources for movies or whatever it is like it would know it would know to go and search for it from there and you give it that tool that uh this tool is a csv generator or this tool is a an excel sheet builder that allows you to take that information and build out the the CSV. And this tool is going to allow you to produce um, a link to the Google Sheets and then pro you know, provide it back to the user who has made the request. It opens up a lot of possibilities, Alex, for sure. <laughs> so I I wonder um, if, I believe it was 3.5, 3.5 we said was when the system messages came <laughs> into place. So if that's going to be used uh, very closely with this, so you give it a very defined uh, function in the system message, like you say, you're a uh, movie, um, you're helping me with a movie review blog site and uh, you're a movie reviewer, or you work for an e-commerce company and you're going to help with marketing and slide deck presentations. Yeah. I mean, you could give it, you, I mean, I think the system messages are, I mean, these guys, Langchain and, and these guys solve for like the system messages already, like with, with some of the things that you can do with, um, you know, I mean, they've called it out explicitly and to your point, I mean, allowing you to define it for a variety of, of use cases moving forward is cool. Well, I think what this has is it goes beyond just the persona the chatbot is taking, but also like giving it actual tools to work with <laughs> and that's where but it's a, it's a similar concept to your point you're giving it like parameters of how it should act and things like that but i i find that this agent stuff is it's amazing um and he he if you go to the how-to guides um you will find that he has also added things like um search tools allowing you to search um, different types of uh, information, uh, provided like the ability for you to use your own functions, um, the ability for you to run code in terminal, which is insane, like like use. So you could give it a tool that is that has access to your terminal to maybe save a file to a, a folder when it's done doing the processing. So <laughs> wow, so you could just uh be chatting with it and say uh please save, save and close all my files for me. Mm -hmm. like and it would go in terminal and do yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, because they, they have um a tool called um so it has a bunch of tools that they've released as well. And one of the tools is um so if you go to utilities uh, or utils, I think it's it's called utils. There's something called like a Python, uh, what is it called? I think it's called like a Python REPL. Is it Python REPL? Yeah, so there's Python REPL, which allows you to do Python commands. And then there's Bash, which basically allows you to do the terminal stuff. So you could use that as a tool um, to run, you know, list out all the folders, I have all the files I have in this folder and, you know, do something specific with it or whatever you want. It, it, you know what? Like, I like, like thinking about all the stuff when I saw the agent stuff, it just opens up like endless possibilities about what you can do with this stuff <laughs> yeah. beyond just what GPT does very well, but it's using GPT as a, as as that all-knowing employee that is able to go do some really interesting things that you don't want to do, go to yourself. <laughs> so, yeah, it's definitely it opens a lot up. Oh yeah, it does. I mean, what what I've been trying to do, and and you know, I wish I had a lot of time. I sometimes I yeah, I think you you mentioned it the other time. I wish I had. Um, on limited hours um, is to create utilities that can be used on, in Promsicle for this, these things. Like how do I make agency something that you can configure without writing code for it is something that I'm, I'm, I'm looking into as well. 
like how do I simplify it in a way that is just a, a few clicks and then you can define your own agent basically that does interesting things and give it the tools that it needs. Like how do I abstract that from code is sort of what I'm trying to figure out. So like the first no code solution to making GPT apps. I mean, there, there, there are a few, I mean, if you've been checking out, like I've, I've been following a lot of what YC is doing um, in terms of which companies they're funding. There are a lot of tools that are doing, like a lot of guys are building this stuff. <laughs> like I've seen some, um, I forget the name. I saw one they funded, which basically allows you to use like, um, these sort of drag drop elements to connect like different AI models together. Like, oh, if an email comes in, take the context from the email, summarize the email, store it here, then provide an, a response with this. And then, you know, you can build out your entire workflow using some GPT capability. So that is already happening. But yes, that is part of what I want Prompt Circle to become is like, a really easy interface to utilize these capabilities because yeah, if you can, if you, if, if I can abstract what agents do and make it more like no code, that would be pretty cool. Yeah. And now that I think of it there, I definitely have seen a, f a few, uh, few options out there. Like, uh, I I've seen one for, uh, YouTube videos, mm -hmm. uh, where you can, see when you get a comment on a YouTube video and then connect to open AI to, uh, reply to that. But yeah. I, I think there's just so much further you can go with this. Like that's just the first, first, first level you could actually build in, allow people to build in these functions you mentioned to make the AI more, more powerful than it, it is by itself. Yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, if you kind of look at what is APR has built and try to kind of even use that as a tool, like use Zapier as a tool, as an example. Just imagine how much you can connect into if you authorize Zapier. And actually, while, while I'm talking about this, it does seem like Langchain has already added a Zapier natural language actions API. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, Harris, I don't know how Harrison and these guys do it, but you know they're they're constantly updating this library to do things that are really, 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 really cool. Um, it does seem like this Zapier natural language actions has the capability to do these things we're talking about. <laughs> I have to go check it out. It does seem like it has the ability, okay, expose Gmail, find email and Slack and send direct message actions. So basically they are building something that allows you to connect with Zapier. Wow, this is insane. Connect with what? With Zapier. Because Zapier has all these connections already, right? It has all these integrations into like, thousands of applications. So if you were able to integrate that into as a tool um, that, that, that the agent can use, then it would be able to know when to go trigger an email campaign in MailChimp based on some question or random, you know, <laughs> thing that came in or you know, like you can think about whatever you like, you can think about like a million different things that could potentially happen based on that. Because with Zapier, you can connect anything, right? You can connect to your email, to your Salesforce, to your whatever it is. Like you connect a million different things. Um, This is pretty cool. This is pretty cool. So yeah. wow. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't used uh, Zapier myself yet, but uh that that sounds so it sounds like you could just connect to one place and then it has access to all these other apps at, at one one time exactly and now if you kind of combine that with agency right you're saying that look all the apps that i have connections into in zapier are now your tools <laughs> 
<laughs> so if uh, I think the exa- let's, 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 let me, let me just read through the example they gave. So the example they gave was that um, if an email um, was sent in, um, expose email, find email, and Slack send channel message action. So uh, in, in, in Zapier, you have a Gmail action that can send an email. Um, they also have like a Slack action that can send a Slack message. Um, like they have things that can create records. They can do, like you can do so many different things. So now they're using this agent to say, using Zapier, find the email, using the find email action in Zapier, read through the email, summarize the email, and then um, send a Slack message into a channel because because sending a Slack message into a channel is, is also an action. And you're doing all of that without writing a lot of code because the agent is basically knows exactly what it needs to do. It needs to go look through the Zapier's set of, of connections and figure out which ones are relevant based on whatever command you've used. So when I look at the, the agent executor chain, it says, I need to find the email and summarize it. And then it says the action I need here is a Gmail action with a find email. And then it says the action input I need is finding the latest email from Silicon Valley Bank. Then it goes and gets that email. This is using the, the, the find email action. And it says, okay, I need to summarize the email and send it to the test Zapier channel in Slack. And, and then it says, okay, then I need an action. And the action is send channel message in Slack. And it says, okay, send a Slack channel, uh, a, a Slack message to this channel. And then uh, I know the final answer. I have sent the summary of the last email from Silicon Valley Bank to a channel. Mind blowing. Because when I was thinking about building like the, the platform and doing this connection to sources, it, was, it meant that you have to build a connection for each application. But with this, you don't need that. Like you just you just need to say, here's Zapier, here's all my connections, here you go. That's it. <laughs> yeah, because uh last time we were talking about uh, different projects where you would have to connect with Twilio or you'd have to connect with uh emails. But uh <laughs> yeah, this this definitely simpl- simplifies that. Can it connect with to SQL as well if you have a... Yeah, it does connect to anything. And you can define custom APIs as well in Zapier. I mean, I could think of a lot of <laughs> use cases already. Like uh, just one use case is... So I have a project at work uh, where I'm heading this thing called Amazon uh, Marketing Cloud, which it pulls a certain type of uh, data from, from Amazon. And... I have to stay up to date on any emails about this topic. So I could have just uh, look for any email about Amazon Marketing Cloud and then ping me in Slack would help me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And think about that for customers as well. When, when something new happens here, do the, you know, like sometimes it, fe- it does feel like we've gotten to a point where the simplicity of this stuff, and this is this is not even sort of taking into account GPT four and all of those things. This is these are things you can do with even GPT two. Like these are things that you can do because it's it's really about. I think the biggest capability that GPT has is its ability to understand context. That that is the biggest superpower, because that is why you can use it as an agent. It understands what you're what you're trying to do, and and Harrison, Harrison, Chase, and these guys are just killing it, making it so easy for us to be able to use this these things in real world um, scenarios. is is stunning. <laughs> well, I have, I have, I now have something to, to dive into this weekend. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the million things I have to. to. Oh my god, um, I know we've been going on and on, and I think. We, we can go on for like hours on this stuff because it's just so much. <laughs> um, 
So this is our first sort of go around and I really enjoyed the conversation, um, Alex. And I think we should definitely do more of these. Um, I think it's important to highlight use cases because um, for a lot of people, what's, uh, you know, the, the, the new shiny and the viral things that are going to be out there are going to be about how cool GPT is. But I think that, you know, you and I know that it, it means nothing if it's not actually solving actual use cases and actual problems. So I'm excited that we get the opportunity to sort of brainstorm on these use cases and and have conversations about it. And I ho- hopefully our viewers can learn from it and, and also chip in and, and give us some more thoughts on how they are using these technologies in their own uh, day-to-day and stuff like that. So yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, and hopefully we get to get a chance to do it again. Yes, I, I really enjoyed it too. I almost feel like there's too many use cases now because of <laughs> the ability to increase the amount of context you have so much with uh, having knowledge bases and then also having linking towards mo- multiple different sources at once. It, it's there's You could just go on on and on for forever about different use cases now. Um, but I, I really enjoyed this as well. I, I got a lot out of it. I have a lot to look into right now with Langchain and I think it can help a lot with some of the projects I'm working on now and taking them to the next level. Yeah, and I'll be really curious to, to hear more about those. And uh, yeah, definitely also excited about what that means for you know the other projects I'm working on as well so yeah it's 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 looking really great I think uh, from this perspective um, all right well um, I do hope you have a an awesome weekend and uh, hopefully uh, uh, we get a chance to do this um, you know sometime soon <laughs> yep uh, probably by the time we do it next time things will be completely different who knows, again who knows what's <laughs> Yeah, you know, you were saying earlier on that, you know, it's, we, we we spoke about four weeks ago and, and at the time we're just sort of figuring out, oh, you know, what, you know, how does GPT, you know, do some really basic, you know, give you a command, your return of response. And that was sort of where we were. And it's so crazy to see how far it has come within a very short, short time span. And it, it does feel like this innovation to be exponential. Um, so we just have to, you know, Try to keep up, <laughs> I suppose. Yeah, <laughs> I wish it could slow down just a little bit so I have time to learn all the libraries and everything. But uh, but I can't do anything about that. <laughs> all right. Well, um, all right. yeah, it's it's awesome. Um, good times. Well, uh, thank you everyone for for watching and um, you know subscribe uh, to our channels and uh, for more information about. AI and tech in general and use cases specifically because that's what we focus on. So um, yeah, Um, till next time. Cheers. Bye.